Good afternoon. I'm Eric Protastic, Professor of Public Policy and Political Science and Director of the MPA Program at the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs at Brown University. Thank you for attending uh, today's event sponsored by the Taubman Center at Brown. The Taubman Center seeks to influence American politics and public policy through scholarship uh, and through public opinion polling, student internships, and a robust series of events. I'm pleased today to moderate our panel, Making Every Vote Count, the Future of Voting Rights and Election Administration Reform in American Democracy. Uh, audience members may enter uh, their questions through the Q&A box on Zoom, which I'll be able to see. You can begin entering your questions now if you already have some uh, and throughout the program. And I'll convey as many of the questions as we have uh, time for after um, the first part of our program. So let me briefly frame today's conversation and then introduce our three terrific panelists. The 2020 election and its aftermath point to both admirable strengths and disturbing truths about the state of American democracy. On the positive side, the 2020 election was the most secure in American history. Many Americans took advantage of more convenient voting options, such as voting by mail, leading to record turnout. And state election officials and courts performed their duties with integrity. And yet millions of Americans receptive, were receptive to President Trump's baseless claim that the 2020 election was stolen. Now in the aftermath of high voter turnout, false allegations of rampant fraud, and the January 6th insurrection, many states with Republican legislatures are trying to make it harder to cast a ballot. According to the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, lawmakers have introduced 106 bills in 28 states that would restrict voting access. And many people are concerned that these changes would place disproportionate burdens on racial minorities, younger voters, and other groups. So the questions that I think all concerned citizens need to be thinking about is how can we ensure that every eligible citizen has an equal opportunity to cast a valid, equally weighted vote? And what reforms are needed to restore broad public confidence in the fairness and integrity of election administration in an era of hyperpolarization? To address these questions, we will hear from three of the nation's leading experts on voting rights, election administration, and American democracy. And let me now introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. First, Bruce Kane is professor of political science at Stanford and director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. A pioneer in computer-assisted redistricting, he's a scholar of elections, political regulation, representation, state politics. Prior to joining Stanford in 2007, he was director of the Institute of Governmental Studies at UC Berkeley. His many books include Democracy More or Less, America's Political Reform Quandary from Cambridge University Press. Uh, Professor Kane is the fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Janae S. Nelson is Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she is a member of LDS litigation and policy teams and works with the President and Director Counsel to shape and execute LDF strategic vision. She's testified before Congress on voter suppression, algorithmic bias, and in support of the Voting Rights Advancement Act. Prior to joining LDF in June 2014, Nelson was Associate Dean and a full professor at St. John's University School of Law. Nelson's most recent scholarly publication is Counting Change, Ensuring an Inclusive Census for Communities of Color, which appeared in the Columbia Law Review. And finally, Charles Stewart is Professor of Political Science at MIT and co-director of the Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project, which is a major research effort that applies scientific analysis to questions about election technology, election administration, and election reform. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His research areas include congressional politics, elections, and American political development, and his many books include Electing the Senate, Indirect Democracy Before the 17th Amendment with Wendy Schiller, which was published by Princeton University Press. Each of our speakers will uh, talk for about 12 minutes, and then we'll turn to um, some questions. So, uh, Professor Kane. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, session. Um, I thought I, I would, as the lead off speaker, I would sort of talk about why actually looking at elected administration is probably our best opportunity for doing something constructive. Uh, but that causes me to think a little bit more broadly and put in context the possibilities of political reform. So there are regular cycles to political reform. Uh, with every election, there are issues that come up, some of them more momentous than others. In 2000, we had the problem of the, the actual punch ballots uh, 
and this election, of course, a lot of questions about the Electoral Count Act uh, into that uh, other discussions about uh, in the in particularly in the off season, uh, the off presidential elections, the uh, midterm elections, discussions about uh, attempts to sort of uh, use voter ID and other kinds of uh, ways of restricting the franchise. So uh, this is a thing we do after every election and particularly more momentous given the nature of this election. Now, the problem with political reform is not dissimilar to the problem of uh, policy, introducing policy, and that is that there are multiple problems uh, and, and they enjoy varying levels of consensus. And unfortunately, these many problems are seen increasingly in the modern era through a particular lens of racialized partisanship, populism, and professionalism. Uh, the professionalism, I mean, that you have a lot more people that are making their livelihoods uh, through full-time devotion to uh, political careers. And that introduces a level of specialization and a kind of a very uh, narrow perspective of protecting uh, your turf that you wouldn't normally get if you had uh, something like the politics of uh, you know, 150, 200 years ago. So because there are so many problems of political reform, there's a tendency to get a laundry list at the end, uh, sort of all the different things that people are thinking about in terms of changing the American political system. And the problem with this sort of laundry list is without any kind of prioritization is that you get very dispersed efforts. Uh, and, and as a result, you, you somewhat squander the opportunities you have that are created by this window, this policy-like window that opens up after an election when the problems of the election are fresh on people's minds. Uh, that's somewhat a problem with HR1, although HR1 has a fairly, uh, which is the bill before Congress right now that has a lot of political reforms in it that the Democratic Party is trying to advance. A lot of them have to do with election administration, but there's a lot outs of, uh, in there as well. And uh, so I would say that my focus is that you should focus on something that is both important and has some possibility of creating common ground. So some of these things that are proposed both in HR1 and then just generally in the reform discussion are things that really we can't change unless you change the court. So if you don't like Citizen United, you don't like independent spending, that's not something that you can do through legislation. You basically have to change the court balance. Uh, that's leading some, to some fairly radical ideas, not bad ideas necessarily, but they're, they're pretty dramatic ideas of expanding the court size or, or uh, giving uh, statehood to DC, et cetera. Um, so some ideas are just not in the hands of the legislative branch or the executive branch, they're in the court. Some of the ideas would require constitutional amendments. So, you know, the Electoral College, which has been very problematic uh, since 2000, we've now had uh, two elections that were actually won by the Electoral College, but not the popular vote. But that, uh, you know, you can't change that. There have been attempts and we can talk about the attempts to get around it, but they have not succeeded politically. And then there are some ideas that are just opportunities for pet projects that people have been pushing for quite a long time. So there are a lot of people that are now been advocates of proportional representation for 20 or 30 years and they're uh, coming forward with their ideas to do that. But I, as I said, I think that the practical solutions are ones that are sort of at the intersection of where there's a possibility of consensus. And I mean a possibility because uh, all of this has been made much more difficult by the partisanship, the increasing partisanship, by the populism, the sort of belief that more power should go to the people, and the professionalism that uh, makes people sort of look at it from a very narrow perspective. If you think of Rawl saying that you have to be high, that a good choice is one that's made behind the veil of ignorance, uh, that's not the way the political sector works. It always peaks around the veil of ignorance and tries to figure out what's in it for them. So let me say what I think the major problems are and um, you know, why I think election administration is the best place to start. So to me, when I look at it, what we have is a situation right now of frustration on the part of many independents and Democrats in particular of what I would call minoritarianism. And it's a compilation of th three or four institutions that are all sort of allowing a minority party, a party that doesn't enjoy as many votes to have control. So you have the electoral college, you have the small state bias in the Senate, uh, 
You have the redistricting being controlled by, uh, uh, you know, unified Republican states, and and of course in previous generations by uh, unified Democratic control. You have the court being controlled by uh, the uh, Republican Party, and you have voter restrictions that are targeted towards minorities, uh, especially. So, uh, you know, a lot of this minoritarianism is not just bad for Democrats, but it's bad for Republicans. You can't understand the problem that the Republicans are in unless you realize that they are digging themselves into a deeper hole, dependent on, if you like, the far right. Uh, they have this strong sort of rhino phobia, a fear of being seen weak by others. And so you just get into a deeper hole of right and writer politics. And this minoritarianism I is also uh, enabled by something that I wrote about in this Democracy More or Less book, which is the sort of layered legacy of previous reforms and changes that have been shaped by this populism and by the extreme partisanship and the professionalism. So, you know, in the Electoral College, the original idea was the electors would think independently about problems and would be a check on the whims of the populars. Uh, but in reality, of course, uh, the uh, people who are sent to the Electoral College really, by, in some states by law, but by broad expectation, are supposed to do what the voters want. The superdelegates, the same thing. The superdelegates were supposed to be a check, but in reality, superdelegates uh, are constantly have their finger in the wind and are trying to do you know, what the people want. Uh, the primaries and campaign finance laws have exacerbated ideological extremity uh, because not all the voters show up in the primaries, which was an assumption of it. And we have very weakened political party structures with weakened gatekeeping. And I can go into any of all these things, but that kind of conflation of all these problems coming together uh, helped Trump very much uh, in his, uh, in, in, in becoming president. So I do think the place to start, and I'll finish with this, is with election administration. And I think there's a lot of really good ideas that are in HR1, and we can talk about uh, them. Same day registration, uh, requiring 15 day early voting, automatic voter registration, vote by mail, election day holiday, all this stuff fel is restoring felon rights. I, I think all of them have a lot of merit. My problem is that what can be passed by a majority in Congress can be undone the same way. And so uh, whenever you think about political reforms, you have to say, okay, what happens when, uh, when my party or my group is out of power? And uh, you could pass all these things. The Democrats might be able to pass it. I'm not sure that that's true, but you could. But the reality is that you will have nationalized elections in effect, whether that's gonna be challengeable in court is also an open question, but you're nationalizing it. And so that means that instead of having 50 different states and the heroes like Mr. Raffensperger, you're basically going to I, not, just, it, not just nationalize congressional elections, but because congressional elections would be too expensive to do in a different way, you'd basically probably be nationalizing uh, state elections as well. So I think before you do that, you have to realize that with the polarization that we have right now, look at what's happened with our national institutions that were supposed to be making things better. The EAC, the Federal Election Commission, those have, those have fallen apart as a result of the partisanship. And even the independent redistricting commissions, which are in HR1, those have also been uh, torn apart by uh, partisanship. The Arizona one almost didn't succeed last time. So I'll finish with that. I still believe that these reforms in HR1 are worth doing, some of them possibly at the congressional and national level, but more of them should be pushed to the state level is the view that I have at this moment. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Eric. Great, thank you so much, Bruce. Um, Janae. Great, thank you. I'm excited uh, for us to have this discussion. And I think Bruce's comments were a perfect segue to some of what I hope to address uh, in terms of thinking about how we can ensure that every eligible citizen has an equal opportunity to cast a valid and equally weighted vote. And Bruce talked a lot about the For the People Act, HR1, which is a very comprehensive uh, uh, in, incredibly broad piece of legislation that responds to the onslaught of voter suppression that we've seen over the past decade and more. And there are a number of very sensible uh, and what I believe are constitutional ways in which to ensure uh, 
that every eligible citizen has an equal opportunity to cast a valid and equally weighted vote. Uh, some of the ideas in uh, the uh, For the People Act, uh, I think, are, are just plain common sense and uh, will have appeal to people of any political ilk because it actually makes their effort to vote easier. Uh, I think Bruce is absolutely right to flag the fact that this ultimately does become a highly politicized and partisan issue in many ways, because as we've heard, when uh, many elected officials have done their thinking out loud, uh, many people fear what will happen if we have a more inclusive electorate, and especially one that includes a greater number of voices of people of color and other groups that are marginalized and, and at the uh, uh, edges of our society in many ways. But I wanna talk a little bit more about what the For the People Act will do uh, and why those provisions and the act itself should be supported. I'll also put in a plug early for the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act uh, because I think it is another incredibly important piece to improving our elections and improving uh, voter confidence in the fairness and competitiveness of elections. Uh, and there are you know, many other issues we could talk about that I hope we'll get to in Q&A about restoring confidence in our elections, including uh, eliminating disinformation and scapegoating uh, of particular groups of voters. But let's drill down a little bit more on the For the People Act, uh, because I think that really addresses, as I said, what I think are very common sense solutions. And I should say that we at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund fully support the passage of the For the People Act. We are a nonpartisan organization. We have advanced the voting rights of African Americans throughout our 80 year existence. And we see the For the People Act as another step in that effort to ensure that all voters have equal access to the ballot. So the For the People Act was first introduced by, by John Sarbanes and passed in the House in uh, 2019. It is uh, uh, quite deliberately expansive. Uh, it addresses voting rights. It addresses uh, reducing the influence of money in politics by changing the terms of, of uh, campaign finance. And it also, quite importantly, limits partisan gerrymandering. Uh, and in the event that I don't get to touch on that in the short time that I have to talk about it, I want to flag in terms of the constitutionality of this issue and whether these changes should be done through courts or should be done at the national level and be subject to uh, the whims of a change in administration. This was an invitation by Congress uh, in Rucho versus Common Cause to address the matter of partisan gerrymandering at the congressional level. So there are some instances in which we have no choice but to look at a federalized, nationalized solution because, because the courts um, have foreclosed an opportunity to address those issues uh, before the court. Of course, there are state uh, uh, legislatures that have taken up the issue, but we know that states are also prone to partisan and political whims. So uh, with that preface, I want to talk a little bit more about where the bill is. Uh, as we know, the, the Republican majority Senate did not vote on it. It was reintroduced uh, in the current Congress in both the House and the Senate. And uh, we are very hopeful that the bill will advance in this Congress with Senator Merkley as the sponsor um, and, and Senate Majority Leader Schumer publicly indicating that, that this will be the first bill to move in Congress. Um, uh, going forward. So what the For the People Act does quite masterfully is attack a, a wide range of structural weaknesses and vulnerabilities in our election system. And some of the highlights are expanding automatic voter registration, which could potentially add over 50 million new voters to our electorate. Automatic voter registration requires that certain public agencies aggregate data and information that they have in order to register voters automatically when they become eligible. When you are an 18-year-old citizen 
of, of the United States and are not otherwise restricted by some other status, you will be automatically registered to vote. You will have an op opportunity to opt out of that registration if you feel that it is uh, it contravenes personal beliefs or, or choices. But every eligible voter will be automatically uh, registered uh, based on their state's information. And that will be complemented by another feature of the For the People Act, which is online voter registration, enabling people to register online, eliminating some of the vagaries of, of paper registration uh, and making the system more streamlined and less prone to error. There's also the uh, possibility of same day voter registration so that people aren't limited to registering during a certain time period or if their uh, information uh, is not uh, provided to a public agency that enables automatic voter registration in time for election day, they can register right on the spot online on uh, uh, the day of the election to ensure that they, they can cast a ballot that will be counted. Um, Bruce also mentioned what I think is a critically important uh, provision and that is the restoration of rights to persons with felony convictions. We know that the United States incarcerates more people than any other uh, 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 democracy in the West. And our hope is that with the For the People Act passed, it will uh, end what is a byproduct of the mass incarceration of black and brown people. And that is a skewing of the electorate to eliminate those voters uh, from participating in our democracy. And I should note that that has very significant cascading effects uh, in the communities from which they come because there are just fewer voters. It becomes less of a civic culture in those communities. So with rights restoration, um, the hope is that there will be a, 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 a galvanized effort to include those historically marginalized voices in our, uh, in our voting processes. Uh, the For the People Act also expands early voting. And uh, if we have any recollection of the lead up to the 2020 elections, we know that early voting played an enormous role, that there were tens of millions of Americans who voted early in advance of the election. We also know that there was a lot of, there were a lot of problems with early voting uh, in terms of where polling sites were located, in terms of how much access different people in different states had to the uh, convenience of early voting. What the For the People Act does is it standardizes it and makes certain that every American has at a minimum two weeks of early voting uh, to make it much more convenient for people with various work schedules, uh, childcare obligations, or any other restrictions on their time that may make it challenging for them to vote uh, on election day and election day only. We also know that the 2020 elections uh, were uh, uh, characterized by an enormous reliance on vote by mail, people who chose to vote by mail-in ballot. Uh, what the For the People Act does is ensure that everyone has an option to vote by mail with you know, prepaid postage uh, so that it's free for voters and it doesn't uh, exact any economic burden on any voters. And that, again, is another effort to equalize access to the ballot. We uh, also have heard so much, uh, not just in this 2020 election, but in state elections like the Georgia gubernatorial election a few years ago about the uh, sinister use of voter purges that uh, uh, remove eligible voters from the uh, registration rolls, uh, even when they are eligible and, and valid voters. And this uh, act helps to limit states' ability to rely on uh, data that is suspect, um, uh, cross-check data uh, that we've seen criticized quite heavily in the media and that we know is prone to uh, result in the elimination of a disproportionate number of people of color. So the voter purges, voter caging, all of those suppressive tactics are now reined in quite significantly through the For the People Act. There are also issues that address matters of election security. And I think this is an area where uh, there should be 
great bipartisan support to the extent that there are concerns about election security, well-founded or not, the For the People Act, I think, does a, a good job of balancing uh, the expansion of access to the ballot with addressing concerns about election security. So there's increased support for voter verified paper-based uh, voting. Uh, there's more oversight of election vendors. Um, and there's also what I think is incredibly important uh, that I, I started off talking about, um, and that is the issue of false information in elections and deceptive practices that can discourage voters from participating in the election. And uh, of course, there is the all important end to partisan gerrymandering and the establishment of independent redistricting commissions. Uh, there, there is, as, as Bruce, I think, alluded to, uh, an attempt to fix and correct Citizens United to reduce the influence of big money in our politics, uh, which I think is quite admirable and uh, through public polling seems to be something that many Americans support uh, on both sides of the aisle. And so, as you can see, the For the People Act uh, has a, a broad menu of ways in which to improve our election process, to improve access, to improve integrity, and uh, to decrease polarization right. and partisanship, uh, and to and to make sure that we uh, that we have an opportunity to talk about those provisions as well. So I'll end there. Great, thank you so much, uh, Charles. Ah, there we go. Um, thanks, Eric, and um, again, um, thanks to um, the folks at the Taubman Center for, for putting this together and for my panelists and um, for starting up a really great discussion. Uh, I'm going to um, back into um, talking obliquely about H HR1. Um, I'm going to start by taking um, Eric's um, suggestion that, I, um, that we talk about um, the reforms needed to restore public trust in American elections in an era of polarization by starting um, a discussion that actually challenges the premise. Um, um, and that is that um, election administration actually can do anything to um, restore public trust. Um, and so I actually wanna take that on, um, not to pile on to Eric, but, but it is a starting point um, um, frequently in discussions about reform um, or is oftentimes this idea of restoring public trust is used as an argument in favor of reform. And I think actually um, it has its limitations empirically. Um, and I'll suggest a different way of approaching things, which may seem to be kind of ad hoc, but I think um, has a way um, of moving us forward. So actually, so let me take on, first of all, this idea that um, election, changing election administration particularly um, um, is, is a fruitful ad attitude for increasing um, public trust in elections. Um, I have long been a public, a, a public trust um, skeptic, by which I mean I've been a skeptic about the ability of election reform um, to, to move trust in democracy broadly or trust in um, elections um, in general. If we look at, I mean, I'm a scholar, I, mean, I think we're all here scholars in one way or the other of these things. Um, I'm a scholar of public opinion about public confidence. And um, we know a couple of things. And, and that is that what moves public confidence in elections are two things. One, and, and so, um, um, and based on that result, if you want people to be confident, you should guarantee two things. One is that they have a good experience in election day where they vote. And that is something that does move public confidence. The other is you should make sure that their, their candidates win every election. Um, and if you're gonna assure that, then you will get public confidence everywhere. And that points to the fact that the strongest mover of public confidence is um, the loser's effect. And, um, and, and that's, that's a problem we need to, to, to deal with. And I don't wanna walk away from it, but it ends up being the big, you know, the 5,000 pound gorilla in the room is the loser's effect. And I'll come back to that because I, it is a problem we need, we need to address. Um, and there's a plenty of evidence that changes to election administration don't move public trust. I'm um, in a paper that I wrote with um, Stephen Salabahar and Nate Persley a number of years ago, for instance, we showed that the passage of voter um, ID laws 
has not changed public trust, despite what um, the Supreme Court hypothesized back in the Marion County um, um, decision. Um, well, what I'm seeing in the, in the research that I've done after this election is that mail balloting um, causes distrust among Republicans in states where Trump lost, but it doesn't cause distrust among Republicans in states that Trump won. Um, and so, you know, the loser's effect is just all over the place. By the way, it doesn't affect how Democrats feel about things, um, right? So it's, a, it's like Republicans in four states are really exercised about mail balloting. So, you know, the, the, the 2020 election may be particularly skeptical. Um, and, and here's another way in which it made me skeptical. Believe it or not, according to the public opinion work that I've done and some other folks have done, Americans actually are more trusting after the 2020 election that, th that their vote was counted as cast and that votes nationwide were counted as cast than any time in the period in which we've been um, polling on this question. Now, why is that? It's because Democrats are absolutely giddy about the outcome of, th of this election. Republicans were already grumpy in 2016 and 2012 and even 2008 about, this, about the state of American elections. And so, if, if, again, if we, if we, but I don't think many people think that with a riot on the Capitol, et cetera, things are really good with elections these days. And so there's something that we need to think about in terms of this idea of public trust. The problem with public trust, or actually more distrust, is that it is becoming increasingly weaponized, the distrust side of things. Back in 2008, 2012, Republicans were equally distrustful at the outcomes. Um, again, other research that I did in 2012, um, a third of Republicans in 2012 believed that Obama stole the election. Now, that's not 75% of Republicans. But it's, that's a good, good chunk. What we didn't see in 20, 2012 was mobilization around that in violent ways. And so those are the things that seems to me that we, we, we need to be, um, need to be um, concerned about. So problem is this linking of fear, um, fear among political entrepreneurs to, to try to um, reduce access to voting as is happening in Georgia and Arizona and some other places, um, and um, gives rise to gerrymandering in um, particular states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. We know, know that drill. It's a question about whether it's effective or not, but we, we see the motivation there. Um, 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 legislators fearful that they're gonna be cut out of power in the future and that that's motivating things. So instead of trying being motivated by public trust, you know, over the last 10 years or so, I've been advocating that we should um, look at the election administration reforms that make, that empirically can be shown to increase the inclusiveness of the electorate, the convenience of voting, and the security of, of elections. Um, and if we look around, we can see some things that seem to work. Some of them have a consensus, others don't. Some are in HR1 and others aren't. And so, if you were to ask me just a standing start, what are the what are the reforms that I would push on right now that I think actually have some chance of happening, if not in Congress and a lot of state legislatures, this is how I would parse it out. In the area of inclusion, the reinvigoration of the VRA. So the VRAA, for instance, um, you know, get the preclearance rules back up, get the Voting Rights Act um, going in, in a modern way. That could work on inclusion. Pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds. If there is one block of people who really don't vote in America, it's 18 to 30 year olds. They're highly mobile. Um, voting is habitual. And so get them going young, maybe on pre-registration, something that, that, um, that people could, could, could support. Um, vigorous enforcement of disability laws to guarantee access to um, voting, either remotely or in person. Automatic voter registration um, has been mentioned already. Election day registration. Um, there's strong evidence that I'm seeing in this election that 
that the biggest increases in turnout in 2020 compared to 2016 were in the states that instituted election day registration for the first time in 2020. Um, and then finally, better online presence of election officials. This is something that, that is um, a little appreciated, but voters have a very hard time finding reliable information about how and where to vote. Go and Google, how do I vote? How do I register? It's going to be reliable information that's on the second screen. So things like that. On the convenience side, no excuse absentee voting, which has been mentioned, mentioned before, is in HR1, HR1 um, and encouraging more in-person early voting. That's also in HR, HR1. Um, encouraging, like all voting by mail, maybe not mandated at a state level, but for elec local elections could be a good thing. Okay, some convenience things. And finally, security. Risk limiting audits all over the place. Everyone should be doing risk limiting audits, a particular type of auditing that can assure that the results are the proper one. Paper-based voting systems. 95% of Americans are now voting on paper. We need to get that, that last 5% voting on paper. Um, and then in general, better and more accurate record keeping. As somebody who digs into election data all the time, I gotta tell you, it's a mess. Election officials don't always care about tying up all the uh, all the loose ends after an election, um, and we need to do better in actually just verifying and recording that the election was as it as it was. So those are I mean those are my um, th those are my favorite um, reforms, which I think come out of the literature in terms of increasing inclusion, convenience, and and security empirically, some more, more so than others. The final thing I'll say is that with just respect to HR1, my worry about HR1 is that on the election administration side, for all the good um, features in there, and I think it is packed full of best practices, good things to do, it's going to collapse of its own weight because it's going to mandate things that democratic election, local election officials Will, um, will oppose and will oppose very strongly. One of the things I think we need to understand, I'm somebody who talks to election officials all the time, they are tired, they are traumatized. They want to take a deep breath and figure out what among the emergency things they did in this election will stick and which they need to kind of take, take a step back and come at again. What I... <laughs> Fear and uh, anxiety is a powerful motivator. And to suggest now that election officials who just barely got through this election now for the 2022 and 2024 election must do a wide variety of things that are very hard to do and that in many cases don't have a lot of political support in their areas, I worry is going to bring election officials onto Capitol Hill in droves they're sort of like the used car salesmen and um, and um, funeral home directors uh, who back in the 60s and the 70s who opposed um, consumer reform bills. They know uh, members of Congress. They have very strong connections to them. And um, once things get going on HR1, I think, I, I think the weight of those relationships is going to bring things crashing down, which is the reason why it seems to me that um, if we can identify some particular things that have widespread um, support, that we might be able to move them through Congress. But if we can't move them through Congress, then the alternative will be to try to move them in the states um, where um, movement still needs to happen. And with that, I'll, um, I'll stop and turn it back over to Eric. Great. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Um, and a reminder that if you have questions, you can please type them in the Q&A box. We've already received a few, so uh, let me pose some uh, uh, to the panelists. And here's a question from Isabel, who's a junior at Brown. What are your opinions on compulsory voting in general? And do you think this is viable or desirable uh, in the United States? Of course, some other yeah. countries do have compulsory voting. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one as I was one of many co-authors of a report uh, entitled Lift Every Voice uh, that speaks to the possibility of universal civic voting. Uh, listen, <laughs> we've heard two very uh, well-informed panelists talk about the difficulties of passing the For the People Act. Passing universal civic voting would be, uh, you know, probably a bridge too far at this moment. 
but I welcome the question and I was, am delighted to begin to talk more about it to start to normalize the idea in this country. Uh, we would always hope that people are inspired to vote, to turn out to elections because they have reason to have confidence in our system and uh, to believe that it can deliver a representative democracy. Uh, short of that, requiring participation in, in our democracy is perhaps the way to jumpstart greater voter participation and to ensure that some of the electoral reforms that we've been talking about are by default mandated of states because they must also enable voters to meet that civic duty. So I do think it is an idea that is worth considering. It is worth pushing for. Uh, I've been working with a number of scholars, including Miles Rappaport and EJ Dion and, and a number of others to try to get this idea out there in the ether, because I do believe that it is a way to uh, short circuit some of uh, the obstacles that we see to these very sensible reforms in expanding our electorate. Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Do you well, want I was going to say, if I can just add with that, um, as I understand um, the, this effort that Janae is part of, I mean, part of the ongoing effort is to do research into um, states, for instance, where you know counties and municipalities might be able to enact it on their own. And so, one of the maybe one of the ways of normalizing this idea and it, trying it out in the American context would be for the Tacoma parks of the world and other places that might want to be more. Um, Tacoma Park gave a hundred dollar rebate on your property tax if you voted in city elections, for instance. That could be one one thing to try. There's a lot of things that we could try um, that that's consistent um, with um, um, compulsory voting. So I, I I don't disagree with either of the other panelists, but I will point out something, which is <clears throat> compulsory voting. Uh, usually gets implemented in systems that do a lot less voting than we do in America. <laughs> okay, We have primary elections, we have general elections, we have special elections, uh, we have, uh, you know, many different levels of elections. And so uh, we, we put a lot more burden on our voters than other uh, democracies do. So uh, it's not surprising to me that we also have low participation rates because uh, to really vote on some of these elections, you have to pay attention to local officials, you have to pay attention to uh, below national level uh, issues. And so I, you know, I, I'm all in favor of doing what we can to maximize uh, participation, but I think I come down with Charles that let's try some experiments here and there because we do know that in some of these systems that have compulsory voting, people will do silly things with their ballot. They will you know, put in Donald Duck and other things. And so uh, it's not clear to me that uh, making them go through the act of participation is necessarily good for decision-making. We already have some kind of dubious decisions being made by the electorate as it is. Great, thank you. So here's a question uh, from Jonathan from the uh, School of Public Health at Brown. There are many who claim that uh, alleged fraud occurred that it occurred in the way that some states changed their election laws in the months leading up to the 2020 election. Uh, either it was judges, state Supreme Courts, or uh, secretaries of state. Do these allegations have any standing? And what's a good response to them? I think this is an interesting question because we really did see, I think, a conversation sort of morph where people were starting to use the, the moniker fraud, not to describe necessarily voting machines that were broken, but somehow because the Secretary of State extended the timing for, for mail-in balloting, that that made the, the election illegitimate. And so there's a lot of controversy now about what is the role of, of legislatures vis-a-vis -vis other actors like state Supreme Courts and Secretaries of State in shaping the rules of uh, election administration. I think Janae should give us a lecture on the <laughs> infinite state legislature's doctrine, which is something um, I'm afraid we're going to be hearing a lot about. Yep. Um, and um, I'm, I, I'll stop. I won't say very much because I'm not an expert in this, but I've been hanging around with election lawyers a lot. Um, um, I, but I will say that I think it's absolutely wrong to say that what ended up happening in places like Pennsylvania, et cetera, where governors, secretaries of state, and others 
you know, made independent decisions that one might disagree with. I think it's wrong to call that fraud. It might have been wrong, you know, um, and there's ways of dealing with wrong. <laughs> And in some cases, those were adjudicated. In other cases, they remain to be adjudicated. But, but there remains this issue about the role of state legislatures. And it's my sense that conservative legal minds these days want to reintroduce state legislatures more strongly into presidential elections in the same way that, speaking of this book I wrote with Wendy Scheller that Eric mentioned, um, Ted Cruz thinks the state legislature should be um, electing senators now. Um, and so, um, I mean, that's a real thing that I think we're going to be needing to grapple with. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll, I just, go ahead. I'll, I'll just say that, um, you know, voter fraud has morphed over uh, time to include almost any and everything that uh, 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 disturbs the outcome of, a, of particular political parties. It is uh, one just just not an empirically sound concept. There is very little voter fraud in the technical sense, either in-person voting fraud, voter fraud, there's uh, you know, in, an infinitesimal amount of absentee ballot voter fraud, although you know, there, there is a way in which that exists to some extent. Uh, and then you do see some manipulation of the ballot, usually by election officials or candidates or folks from their camp. But the idea that uh, U.S. elections are uh, in any way compromised by uh, a, a degree of voter fraud that can be outcome determinative is just patently false. Uh, but we now see that very alarming claim being uh, uh, asserted uh, toward almost any action that an election elected official may take uh, that a party uh, could disagree with. And we also are seeing that lodged against particular groups of people and specifically African-Americans, which is what caused us to file a lawsuit, the only lawsuit that surfaced the issue of racial discrimination uh, in uh, President Trump's claims that Michigan was engaged in voter fraud and in particular voters in the area of Detroit. We saw the same allegations being lodged against voters in, in Philadelphia and Atlanta and other uh, <clears throat> cities with large black populations. Uh, we should be very alarmed by that racial scapegoating and very alarmed by the misuse of the concept of voter fraud because it really masks the ability uh, for us to get at what may be genuine election administration problems and may also simply be uh, uh, people who can't accept having lost an election through a fair and free democratic process. Yeah, I mean, what happens to phrases in um, political reform once they become politicized is that they gr they grow <laughs> to expand whatever sense of grievance you have. So corruption, for example, which in the law refers to material corruption, is now used by some critics of the political system to mean distortions of the democratic equality principle. Okay, and that's not ridiculous to say that, but it causes confusion in the minds of voters. And similarly with fraud, you have to distinguish between, uh, you know, changes that are made in the normal period and changes that were made in the middle of an emergency. And the reality is that all the states have uh, emergency powers that go to governors and to courts in times of uh, extreme emergency. And that's something actually the three of us, Charles and Janae and I, <laughs> Uh, had to contemplate when we were down in Irvine and participated in a report, we anticipated that there were going to be a lot of these problems that, uh, you know, the journalists were going to jump out and advance and because they weren't getting the results right away, we're going to say there's something wrong, right? And uh, that, uh, you know, that, it, that states that didn't start counting the absentee ballots uh, when they received them would have many, many delays, etc. So, you know, there were a lot of problems that I think uh, lead to, and, and this is sort of a, a slight disagreement with Charles, it's not like it changes the confidence you have in the system, but it does, you could reduce the set of people's concerns if you can spell these things out in advance and explain why situations are going to occur in these emergency situations. So there were a lot of other kinds of emergencies that Norm Ornstein and others that were in our panel were constantly calling our attention to. 
And it's hard because unless you're in that emergency, nobody wants to think about what should we do in this, you know, one in a hundred year event, right? What are the odds that you're going to have a pandemic in the middle of an election year? You know, it's pretty low. And so to get people to worry about that and to, to iron out the procedures is very hard. And so a lot of it has to be done on the fly. And that uh, to the degree that you can regularize that, and I realize you can never get there hundred percent, is the degree to which you can at least take some of these things off the table. Great. So now we have a question from my colleague, uh, Professor Catherine Tate, who uh, says the country is deeply divided. Won't conservative states simply refuse to comply with any new federal election laws and take it to court? Um, it's really sort of the, you know, will we see resistance? How fierce will we see implementation resistance, even if we were able to pass some of these federal election laws? Yeah, it reminds me of the Clean Power Plan. <laughs> <laughs> Only that wasn't really passed by the legislature, it's passed by executive action, but still, absolutely you will get resistance and pushback and uh, not only because some of these states are not going to want to expand the electorate um, you know it's, that's not the only reason i mean i think the problem is going to be that if you change of all the units of state government and county government the election units are usually the least well-funded they're manned partially by volunteers etc and you know so if you change it for the congressional elections, there isn't going to be enough money and capacity to not change it for state elections, right? And so, you know, there's the, as I, I can't remember, I think it was Charles who was talking about the election officials. It's not just the Republicans that will be mad. As Charles was saying, there are going to be a lot of election officials that say, wait a minute, you better have a phase-in plan for this <laughs> because there's no way we're going to be ready to do this by the next election. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of pushback. And I don't buy the argument that this is a, a grant, you know, that this is a slam dunk if it goes to the court. Now, admittedly, I am practicing law here without a degree or, uh, and so it should be taken as a grain of salt. But I, like Charles, have hung around the election lawyers way too much time for my own good. And I really do believe that that challenge is much more likely to be problematic than, than uh, some people seem to believe at the moment. Yeah, I mean, if I can weigh in, I, I, I agree that it is no slam dunk, um, but I think we all know that whether something's a slam dunk in the court or not is not always dependent on uh, the strength of the constitutional arguments. Um, Congress has the power to regulate the time, place, and manner of elections under, art, art, under Article One of the Constitution, and it has done that through the National Voter Registration Act, through the, through the Voting Rights Act, through the Help America Vote Act. Uh, we have precedent for this, and, and it is within Congress's power to regulate federal elections. You know, and Bruce is absolutely right. Um, the result will be that this will transform state and local elections because there just isn't the capacity, the wherewithal, or, you know, really a, a justification for running two separate election systems. And, and these reforms are not terribly controversial. They're, they're only controversial when you put them up against what have been rampant voter suppression efforts over the past decade or more, that we're, we've been veering so far in the other direction that pulling it back to center and thinking about ways to make voting accessible and friendly uh, seems to be a radical notion, and it really shouldn't be. Great. So here's a question perhaps for Charles. Um, have computerized election machines and software made elections more reliable or less? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> um, so we'll have to parse this out um, a bit. So the first thing I'll say, just remember that human being, well, well elections, um, especially counting votes, counting votes is incredibly tedious, mind-numbingly tedious. And to go back to something that Bruce said earlier, Americans vote um, on more things than anyone else. I always like to um, repeat um, what um, Nelson Polsby used to remark, which is still pretty much true, that a voter in San Francisco in a presidential election will vote in more things than a citizen of Great Britain will vote in in a lifetime. And so 
It's a lot of tedium in counting that, and human beings are terrible at that. Computers are really good at it. And so one of the things that we know is computers have been very good at making the counting of ballots more accurate. Been very good in helping to keep track of people moving in voter registration systems. Been very good in helping to speed th people through polling places by being able to look up people, et cetera. So there's been unquestionable improvements to elections because of automation, um, especially scanners. Um, we are not ready for voting on touchscreen machines, however. And it's not so much because of my view about hacking. It's rather that, um, again, empirically, we know that um, um, computerized machines are um, mistakenly programmed, have bugs in um, the software, um, the tablets are um, miscalibrated um, from time to time. And if you don't have paper, something independent to capture the, the election, if there is a problem, you're toast. You can't recover. Um, and so that's why that while computers are, are indispensable for, I, I think, for tabulating votes, and the evidence is very strong about that, um, that there remain to be problems about using computers um, and solely computers without some sort of independent verifiable backup to record people's votes. I'll finally, I'll, I'll say, I mean, there's a controversy right now about using machines that are called ballot marking devices, um, where you use a touch screen to mark your choices, but then a, a, a paper ballot is printed out, you can look at it, and then you can scan it about is that good or bad? The thing I'll note is that um, people make a lot of mistakes when they, when they, um, when they um, fill out their ballot by hand. Um, and um, we, in any given election, there's gonna be something around a couple of tenths of 1%, two or 3% of voters who will smudge a ballot, will mark a vote for a candidate and then write that candidate's name in down below in the right in line. And um, they make just dumb mistakes that a ballot marking device makes impossible. Right. Um, and so I tend to err on, on the side of ballot marking devices being better than being good. Um, but that's gonna be the new technology argument over the next um, few years about whether that technology is more the benefits of fewer errors or causes um, problems of further intermediation between the voter um, and the choice. So well, I'm going to, oh, I, 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 I would, I would buy everything he said about the where we are right now, hmm. but I'm going to say something that Charles isn't going to agree with, <laughs> which is we make a mistake if we don't invest a lot of time and effort and science into eventually moving to online voting with biological verification and with uh, you know the proper encryption. We're trusting our money to the banks. We can eventually trust our vote. There's a long way to go. We're not there. But I think the computer scientists killed the baby <laughs> back in 2000. And, uh, you know, and they've kind of been obdurate about it. But the reality is you talk to the young kids and I get a lot of CS students in my class and you realize there's been a lot of technological evolution in computer science in the last 20 years in terms of encryption, in terms of I can get onto my computer by using my finger, okay, and getting a fingerprint. So I can imagine that in the next 10 to 15 years, with the trend to convenience voting, which is really, you know, I think unstoppable, it was here before we had this election, people are going to want to vote, particularly in states where they have to vote for, as you say, uh, the phone book. Uh, they want to vote at home. And this business of waiting for two weeks until you get the results of elections, you know, because people have to count and recount and all that, I think they're, that, that's just not going to be a sustainable equilibrium over the next 20 years. So I believe that we should be investing and thinking about that and doing some experiments with it over the next uh, decade or so.
Actually, right. I, and I would, by the way, I don't disagree with that at all. So, oh, all right. You're the only so, other person I found, Charles. <laughs> so, I, I wrote, well, there's a National Academy of Sciences report I helped write, which agrees entirely with that. So, so let me ask uh, one final question because we're running uh, up at the 5 p.m. hour. And that is to step back a little bit and, and look at the broader political challenge to, to election reform. I noticed that you know, uh, there was a piece uh, put out by the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank by a scholar that said, you know, it's really not a good look for Republicans uh, to be appearing that uh, we wanna make it harder for citizens to, citizens to vote. Uh, it, it looks like we don't believe our own ideas uh, can compete uh, uh, and, and win in a, in a fair fight with the Democrats. And that's clearly not the majority view, uh, but that was somewhat hopeful. And my colleague, Mark Sutzman uh, asks, is there any possibility for a sort of grand bargain between uh, Democrats and Republicans where you know trading some kind of uh, stronger uh, access uh, protections, reinstatement of the Voting Rights Act, for tougher security measures, maybe even a universal biometric voter ID. Leaving that aside, uh, is there, in your view, anything that will change the politics so that we can sort of break through this partisan divide and begin trying to have election reform that will strengthen our democracy, that will find support from not only progressives, but also from at least some conservatives? Well, I would think Janae would jump in on this. Uh, that's an interesting deal, Danae. I'd be interested in your view on that. Would you take the Voting Rights Act, which we def desperately need to, to get back uh, for some trading on, uh, you know, a voter ID, state issued voter ID, I don't know, something on the other side. Would you take a trade back? Because that's pretty important to get the Voting Rights Act back. Yeah, you know, I hate to be the voice of pessimism, but I can't envision a deal that is on the table that does not include some mechanism for suppression uh, being proffered. I, I believe quite strongly that there is a fear of competition of ideas, um, that there is, I mean, I, I'm not making that up or even uh, surmising, there's basically been confessions of the same, that the more people vote, then the, the likelihood that the chances of uh, the Republican Party to to prevail in many elections uh, diminishes quite significantly, and so that tells me that any uh, any bargain that is struck uh, is likely that includes some form of voter ID or some something that um, could potentially restrict access to the ballot uh, is one that we would have to look at quite carefully uh, to see whether it's it's a Trojan horse or a legitimate election reform. And I say that again from a nonpartisan posture, but just uh, recognizing the statements that have been made uh, about a fear of a more inclusive electorate. I, I, you know, I, I think we're gonna have to see where the current moment lies, you know, lands. You know, right now there's, feelings are raw. Um, a lot of bills, I, I think Janae was mentioning all the bills that have been introduced to roll back um, gains. Um, but state legislature is going to take a long time, I think, um, sitting on these bills. And, and as I talk to people in the states, they're actually, you know, th there may be openings um, for Democrats and Republicans, again, to come together. I mean, I, I just point out, for instance, that while this is not a... a, 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 a um, um, this is not a deal that Janae would have taken. Like West Virginia got automatic voter registration when a um, photo ID law was being considered, and a Democrat got up and said, "Well, you're never going to you're going to do that. We should get automatic voter registration." And something happened, and enough Republicans agreed that it got added to the bill. Um, in Georgia, you know, things could go off the rails there, but there's actually, I mean, hopes among even some Republicans, that the rollback won't be all that awful. Um, and that, um, that there actually might be some um, um, ability to um, kind of maintain um, early voting and, 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 and abs absentee voting. And so, um, you know, dial back in in a couple of months and let's see where we are. I mean, right now is probably not the right time to, to ma be making predictions. Great. Well, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, thank you, 
Janae Nelson, Charles Stewart, Bruce Kane. Uh, thank you, Samantha Griffin, and everyone at the Taubman Center for sponsoring this event uh, and appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you.